I'm very pleased to have my colleague, Michelle Holloman, filling in for Dr. Rob Weiss tonight. He was unable to be here, so she graciously volunteered or got voluntold. I don't know which, but she's here, and that's all I care about. So, so yay. Um, I was just introducing her a little bit, and she can tell you a little bit more about her, uh, her work, but um, she is part of our Seeking Integrity Seeking integrity. I gotta look at I gotta look at mine. I can't look at yours. She's part of our seeking integrity team. Uh, she's the family specialist, uh, so works with those, um, particularly with the loved ones of those who are in our program with proper releases and all of that. And, and again, with uh, therapists that um, are referring. So again, with proper releases, we don't tell anything or share anything. It's all you know up to the clients. But um, she is a CSAT trained uh, therapist. She also did the training with Dr. Ken Adams. So when we talked about mother and mesh men, uh, she's had the training uh, to work from that framework as well. So, so lots of good training, great person, really uh, cares and passionate about this work. Um, and so we're going to start. So Michelle, I don't know if you've done this before, but if at the bottom of your screen, I'm going to, you should be able to click on the Q and A. Oh, I see them. Okay. So if you click on that, I'm, I will read them. Okay. Um, and then uh, then we'll, we'll answer. So hmm. my husband has been in and out of recovery for a number of years and is now taking a more, taking it more seriously. Well, that's great. He had physical affairs, emotional affairs, cyber sex, pornography. He is not a beginner in recovery. So decided to take out of the doghouse class instead of sex addiction 101. Tonight's the fifth class of out of the doghouse. And he's deciding whether to take part two. In light of his acting out activities, was it a mistake not to take this one-on-one class? He's now seeing a therapist and attending groups. How is best? Um, yeah, so I, I think she's kind, I think he or she is asking which um, way is kind of best for the husband to like what trajectory is out of the doghouse or the sex addiction 101. Um, I think either of them is great, but since he's not a beginner in recovery, um, it sounds like the out of the doghouse is a good choice because um, it focuses more on how to uh, talk about partner stuff. So for you, it would probably be beneficial on how to better interact with our partners in the out of the doghouse, learn more about empathy. Um, I mean, I don't think you can go wrong with either of them. Um, so I don't think either would be a mistake. I don't ever think any work we, we do never goes wrong, but I do like that he he's taking it more seriously. Um, I do like, oh, he's deciding whether or not to take part two. I see that. So he did 101, the first part. Okay. I, I mean, I think either way, I love that he's seeing a therapist now and attending groups. So I think either way um, is a great way to continue recovery and just really pad, pad that kind of education. Um, and I do like that the out of the doghouse class really focuses in on more of the relationship and starting to kind of heal that. I think that'll be helpful for both of you. So I don't think that's a, either way, isn't, there's no kind of wrong answer there. But I'm, and, I'm, and I agree with that. I'm going to, um, uh, with a caveat. So yeah. like, fortunately he's yay. He's finally taking it seriously. Right. So, but I want to back up. Like we have people, you know, I hear about people that relapse and I do recommend the sex fiction one-on-one, but guess what? We have another one of those groups starting, I think on February 18th, he can start, you can do two groups at a time, or you can just, you know, however it, so, so the fact that he started great. Um, I, I'm also going to, cause like, I'm a stickler on this one. Um, uh, so he's been in and out of recovery. So in what I hear is he's been in sobriety. He's had some sobriety. He's had some abstinence, but when he's doing all of this stuff and just kind of relapsing, even if the cycle is a little bit stretched out, like, okay, he didn't do it every 90 days. Now he's doing it once every six months or whatever. He, he's still not happy, joyous, and free. You know, I mean, he has not gotten to the foundational stuff. So, so I'm glad he's taking it more seriously. And I agree with Michelle, either, either path is great. The fact that he's doing great. Um, and if he wants to, I mean, if he's finding 
doghouse to be a really good fit and it's resonating and he's learning some things everything in doghouse dr rob says this all the time you know here's here's a suggestion on how to you know to restore a relationship learn some empathy do some things rebuild trust you yeah, don't have to do those things mm -hmm. but then you don't have to be in a relationship either so you know it's like you pick and the um, big step is that now he's seeing a therapist and attending groups like that. I'm assuming it's a CSAT trained therapist because a generalist, I hope, because a generalist yeah. therapist is not trained for this. I hear this all the time that people go to a generalist therapist that have very little training in addiction and right. no training in this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I bump into this stuff all the time. So I, you know, I mentioned yeah. like all of Michelle's and she's just one of our professionals mm -hmm. on, on staff, but like highly trained because it matters, you, you know, like you as partners are stuck, you know, mm -hmm. well, not completely stuck. You guys can have your healthy boundaries and all that. But, you know, when, when the addict is, you know, spinning around going, oh yeah, in and out, you know, lying to themselves and you. So, yeah. And I always liken it to, you know, I always tell partners and my addicts, like I wouldn't send somebody with cancer to like yes. general practitioner. Like I'm sending you to an oncologist. And if you have a you know, specific type of cancer, I'm going to send you to that type of oncologist. And that's exactly what this addiction is like. We're not sending you to, you know, not only an addiction specialist, but you need to see someone who specializes in this work because this is very specific type of addiction. And we do have the training to do it. And, and we, this is for most of us, this is all we do, all yes. we do in our own practices. Well, so. and this is what we do, like, this is all our treatment center does. So at Seeking yeah. Integrity, this is all we do. We are not a hundred bed campus. We are not, you know, like, you know, we're not doing, you know, all these other things. However, we are really addressing the underlying issues. You stop the behaviors, address the underlying issues, have a plan for moving forward, which sounds so simple, but it's really complex work. You know, the, those guys, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard work, but they're supported. I often use the term safely cocoon because I think our clinical team safely cocoons them so that they're able to hold the space. And I, I say this often too. It's like, you know, I think the garage of the residents in our treatment center is full of trash bags of the, of the yes. shame <laughs> and lies and the junk that, that addicts accumulate so that they can le leave, leaving mm -hmm. that stuff in the garage so that, you know, okay. we'll just take that and they can move forward. Yeah, we, we really do. We create this very safe kind of bubble where they can start their healing. And then when, by the time they go and they leave us, they really kind of re-enter the world as this different, um, starting to really do their best healing and ready to, um, get on the road to more in-depth healing, really start the process kind of like with they're starting from this extra it's like a vitamin shot or something that we give them. It's great. Yeah. I'm yeah. Really and they're not all fixed magically in 14, 21 or 28 oh. days. However, I, I think they have a really solid foundation and the oh. support and resources in which to, to build on that. So it, yeah. you know, it does we work make on the partners sense. having that too. Like yeah. now we're also providing that to partners and making sure they have that too, which is really, I think been really positive. So we're excited about that. So the next question, as a betrayed partner, what is the best thing I can do to support my SA husband while he is working his recovery? Oh, that's a great question. Um, there are so many great things that we can do as, as um, betrayed partners to support um, our significant others. Um, I think, you know, really taking that pro-dependent approach is important, you know, loving them through this and having empathy and also taking care of ourselves. I think it's really important that we do our work as betrayed partners and seek out our own support, um, really learning our own healthy boundaries and what feels safe to us and getting the support to start healing ourselves so that we're not um, struggling along the way. And I think something that I encounter a lot with our partners is that they really feel sometimes that, oh, the addict is getting all this support and all this help and all this attention, which can sometimes happen when they come to treatment. And 
we offer so much support also to the betrayed partner. And that's so important to get a CSAT and, and find your groups and find your people and, and find the other people that connect with you because we can't do this alone. We all need that support. So the best thing you can do for the addict is to do your work and kind of keep your side of the street um, clean as well for you. Just, it sounds ironic, but the best thing you can do for, for them is take care of you in your own way. Um, in my, yeah, I think. yeah, and I think, yeah, the healthy boundaries for mm -hmm. you is for your safety. It's not punitive. It's not like you're, no. in, but it's really what you need for your world to be safe. And I, I often think too, for partners, it feels like, and I'm going to use pronouns, his addiction, her, just because it's easier. So, but can be male or female addict partner. But so, so that's the framework I'm coming from. But if his addiction is taking over all, all of you, you like it's intrusive on all aspects of your life, you know, that, that isn't fair for you either. So mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, when Michelle's talking about your side of the street, it's really like, what do you need to do to create safety for you? Um, I often talk to partners who are like, oh, I can't hold boundaries. Well, then they're not boundaries. You know, like if, if they're like a sieve, you know, they're, you know, they're not boundaries. So what do you really need to support you to create safety for you? Trust your gut. Um, but, but it isn't, um, it isn't, oh, you know, oh, good. You know, you've got your 30 day chip. It's like, you can acknowledge it, but it's still okay to understand, you know, but you betrayed me for 10 years, you know, like both of those realities are, are true. So and you're um, allowed to be angry. You're allowed to be sad. You're allowed to have all these feel these frustrated feelings. It's allowed. You're definitely, these are all really valid. Um, it's, but you need a place that's safe for you to express these because you can keep expressing them to your addict and you guys will just kind of continue going back and forth very often in this cycle that, you know, ultimately it won't help you as a betrayed partner. So um, creating a sense of safety and a sense of your own community, somewhere where you can talk about things and other people will connect with that and you don't feel alone is so imperative. And it's the same way for the addict. Everybody needs their own space to start their own healing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the best thing you can do to support him if we're using heteronormative. Um, yeah, pronouns. it just makes it a whole lot easier. Otherwise, yeah. I get all caught up in the pronoun. So it really yeah. is with no nothing other than ease of conversation. So right. that's the only, yeah. So, okay. Um, next question. How do you start the conversation with a man who, you know, is enmeshed with his mother? Wow. Well, how do you start the conversation? Well, I can tell you how you don't, you don't go up and say, you know, you're enmeshed with your mom. Um, I think enmeshed is a really tough kind of word to use. Um, I think it depends on who that person is to you. If it's your husband, I think this would be really tricky because very often, um, you know, it sounds very accusatory and kind of what's not helpful is, you know, well, you're enmeshed with your mom. You don't really want to sound super naggy, but, and even if you aren't and you're very careful, he may hear it that way. Um, I think this is a really good time to seek professional support and guidance. Um, seek someone who is trained in mother enmeshed men, because when we, as if, when, as lay people, if we try to explain this to somebody, it really kind of comes off sometimes, it can come off as preachy or kind of luxury. And sometimes they don't really understand what we're talking about, because if the man is actually enmeshed, he sees this as love and he sees this as this is just how my family is. This is just what we do. And he may not really understand the concept. Um, it's a very tricky road to kind of navigate in my experience. And I think it helps to have some support and have someone who's trained kind of, what is this like for you? And what is this like for you? Um, I mean, I think you can always hand someone a book like, you know, when he's married to mom, but I think that can also be really triggering. And um, I've had guys get handed that book by their wives and then they identify their wives as the one who are messed. Oh, wow. Oh. It happens all the time. 
Um, so while I'd like to make it that easy, um, you can always, you know, contact Dr. Adams and he, they give great referrals. Um, but yeah, I think it's, enmeshment is one of the trickiest things that I've ever kind of encountered. And it's, and, you know, pointing it out to someone is kind of almost like pointing out to someone that they're an alcoholic. There's going to be a lot of denial and a lot of very strong, um, denial systems built into that. It's very old wounds. And I think when, when we try to point things out to people, usually people aren't ready to hear that. Um, and, and they, they may not be ready to do that work. And that's where someone with the professional experience can really help you navigate um, how to do that and help you set up your own boundaries around it and help you navigate what this is like for you um, and how you can deal with that. Um, especially if you're the wife of a man who is enmeshed with his mom. So uh, and it is really tricky. And, and because um, if you think about it, that family system, you know, he from a very young age, you know, and this is the expectation. And it like, I've seen this so often, and this is just my anecdotal, but um, an experience, but, but where sex addiction is easy, because there, there's no love, there's, I mean, it's transactional, you know, it often, you know, the hookup kind of sex, because there's no affection, there's no um, uh, there's no betrayal to the right, parent yeah. relationship. And right. it's hard because if you're married to someone and that person is tied to mom, then, you know, there, you know, you, you're already kind of outside of the, you're on the triangle and it makes it very difficult. So, right. um, and CSATs are trained to, to deal with mother enmeshment. Um, but I think sometimes, I think sometimes we, you know, we, we can deal with this. And if, if you have a CSAT, who's really good at it, that's awesome. But I also think CSATs are kind of the best place to go with this. And, and if they need, you know, if it's a very serious case, they can also are kind of the best people to point you in the right direction on how to find that extra support. Um, like Dr. Adams has, um, he has workshops and intensives and stuff like that. Um, which is sometimes really helpful. Sometimes someone needs to do a little extra, you know, work with that. So, and, um, and I know we have, you know, resources on our website too. Sex and yeah, I just put um, on the uh, sex and relationship healing.com. I put a link to the podcast, but you can find them there. And we're referring to Dr. Ken Adams, who wrote silently seduced and when he's married to mom. So he is, I mean, he really has, um, mm -hmm been a pioneer in that field, uh, you know, in that particular area. And he does intensives. However, he also did a podcast, which I think is the most, I, last time I checked, that was the most downloaded podcast on our podcast series, the sex, love uh -huh. and addiction podcast with Dr. Rob. So, you know, it's an issue and it may be, you know, listen to the podcast and yeah. And, you know, you might go, gosh, you know, this was really interesting to me. And I'm, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what the, and it really probably depends, particularly if sometimes the guys are, you know, are starting to bristle under mom, you know, so then they, they may be more open to discussing yeah. it, but it really, I agree that it is tr tricky because if you're the outside person and this is such a link, you know, you're going to be the outside person. So, yeah, it's, it's a very challenging, it's very challenging for kind of everybody in the, in the system and it can get really kind of murky. And so it's really important to get specialized support for it. Um, but it's yeah. so freeing for the guys that, oh, that do this yeah, work. Yeah. And I'm saying guys again, but you know, and there are women that are enmeshed as well, but you know, in those family systems, but for the guys that do that work, it's, it is emancipating because mm -hmm. like they can show up at, you know, like they can choose and have, you know, the healthy boundaries that they need. It isn't that they have to, you know, shut mom off completely. They just come to the relationship different, which is very similar to what we talk about all the time with betrayed partners showing up differently with what do you need? need for a safe relationship you know, that's that's you know I, Gavin um uh, Sharp did a, a webinar on this series about addict healthy boundaries and I loved it it was such a good one um December 3rd and you know I, I will put the link in the chat um again but everything's on sexyrelationshiphealing.com but but he talked about 
every human needs healthy boundaries and like took it out of the addiction world. And I was like, that is so helpful to be reminded yeah. that yeah, humans need healthy boundaries, you know, for all yeah. areas of our life. And that's just so that we can interact in our best ways you know, in, in a safe, you know, that we aren't over giving or, you know, under, I mean, it's just what we need. We think of, we think of boundaries as negative things very often. And we think of them as these things that we have to put in place that, you know, are, are somehow confrontational and, and they're not. So, um, you know, learning how to do this in a kind way that really helps keep people that are safe to us, bring them in and connect with, and the people who aren't so safe or healthy for us a little further away, or that's really important because it's just a way to, um, you know, connect with those we want to and not connect so much with people we don't, but boundaries are for everybody. It's not just, um, it's not throwing up a wall, you know, or, you know, being super close. It's, it's not black and white. It's, it's a very gray area. And, um, but I think, it's kind of a very common thing for addicts, non-addicts, everybody to think setting a boundary is this very taboo thing and it's mean and cruel and it has to be, you know, this wall you throw up and then you never talk to them again. And that's a really big misconception. So I encourage everybody to listen to Gavin's, um, Gavin's podcast. It's really good. So, so the person that asked about the enmeshment ads in the chat. So it, you don't recommend mailing the book anonymously it's for a boyfriend oh, probably I, not going to be no. as most helpful so I, that's a little tempting really really tempting yeah, but. tempting but I, I don't think you know I think doing that is it's very tempting but I but I think that's kind of one of those things where it could really backfire and I would rather just everybody communicate I'm all about communicating openly and being honest and you know, being authentic and all that good stuff. Um, but it is tempting. I think it would probably backfire. And, you know, I'd always go like, well, did you get the book? Did you not? And then mm -hmm. what happens when they find out that you're the mm -hmm. one who sent yeah. it? And then you're not really dealing with the problem. You know, you're kind of like, by the way, you know? Well, and I think that there's some other, you know, resources. So um, uh, Dr. Stan Tech can also did a podcast. Yeah on sex and relationship healing.com with Dr. Rob and his is a we do and what you do that's good for the relationship is actually good for each of you individually so you know so maybe a softer like hey you know I, I heard this about we do you know, what would we need to do to focus on our relationship like and you know then it could start a conversation of like you know what what do what do we see as getting in the way you know personally of us you know being able to move forward together so so yeah it's challenging yeah. but you know you may find some you yeah, know, could some other like, avenues I heard this podcast maybe we could listen to it together it was really interesting and just kind of saying did anything you know did anything resonate with you did you have any thoughts about this and he'll probably say no not really I just I don't even know why you, but you know it's planting these little seeds along the way sometimes and I find that sometimes people will think of things later and that's kind of maybe a good way to try it just listen to it together and have a conversation about it rather than anonymously mailing someone a book yeah and at least you're getting a conversation tempting. Fine. yeah it's very yeah. Tempting. yeah yeah I understand but I also think you know I mean it's a boyfriend so so mm -hmm. I think you're getting some really good information. I mean, like good that you're looking at really this now, good. you know, instead yeah. of uh, I've been married for, you know, 30 years and, um, you know, he's still it. enmeshed with his mother and, you know, like, I mean, you know, he's over there every three hours and you know, whatever, I'm making this up. Actually, yeah, I've heard some he, of those, you know, so. It's great that she cares about him. Like she really is already, you know, caring and, you know, trying to support in that way mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. for you. Okay, so the next question, are all porn addicts usually bad at sex? Oh, um, <laughs> well, I haven't watched a lot of porn addicts, um, but I don't think that that is true. I haven't really had that conversation about are they good or bad, but here's what I can say. I do think that people who watch a lot of porn believe that that is what sex is supposed to be like, which is what I think you're kind of inferring that there's a lack of connection, which, you know, porn really teaches us that 
sex is supposed to be a certain way. So, you know, every time the woman is supposed to have an orgasm every single time and our bodies are supposed to look a certain way. And, you know, we're supposed to change positions like 45 times and it's this very hurried and, you know, powerful and everyone, I don't know, it's this very kind of intense, whatever experience. And I think if you're a porn addict, you're probably thinking, well, that's what sex is like. And there's no intimacy. So that would probably classify as bad sex for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, that would be what porn addiction is. There's a lack of intimacy, a lack of connection. Um, the other side of that, which I find kind of interesting is when people early on get into really good recovery and we start doing sexual reintegration therapy with couples, the opposite starts to happen where the guy, uh, where the husband or the addict, it kind of goes the other way, the pendulum swings the other way, and then he thinks everything is some rom-com. So it kind of goes oh. both ways. It's really interesting and fun. that's why I like working with the couples. But I don't think it's that they mean to be bad at sex. They just have a very distorted view of what actual sexual intimacy is and what connection really is, um, which is why we encourage them to get into recovery and understand that sex is simply an expression of whatever the relationship is and, um, and, and an expression of love and, you know, another expression of your relationship. Um, and it's not, you know, I mean, I've really had people who didn't understand that every time pizza was delivered, like that's not actually what happens. So it's, it really changes your brain. And unfortunately for some people, that's the only um, education they have about sex. So well, and yeah, and the, you know, and they've started it at a young age. And Very like you said, age. that's all they've, and it does distort male or female. You know, I, I hear the female thinking that they have to be like the porn star, you know, so, <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, I mean, it, it were, and you cannot in a real relationship get the dopamine that you do when you get a thousand images and all of this new and different and all of that. So, so it makes it more challenging, you know, to, to go, Oh, I want to connect with this person in a real and meaningful way. And, you know, it could be awkward. It could be funny. I mean, all of these things I have to be okay with that because porn no. will never disappoint you because it's right. like just, but it's also not, ever, you're never going to connect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then porn induced to... erectile dysfunction and yeah, I mean, all those things too. Yeah. So, but... I mean, you know, sex is funny, like things go in the wrong place and there are noises and, you know, you're, you know, you get a leg cramp and you might fall off the bed and you roll over on the dog. I don't know, like things happen and that doesn't happen in porn. Everything's airbrushed and beautiful in a lot of cases. And it's like, you know, that, that's not real life. <laughs> like that's not what happens. But unfortunately, if that's the only image and you know thing you've ever seen about what it's supposed to be like then that's what you're going to think it's supposed to be like and when that doesn't happen you know if you're you know some addicts get angry when it doesn't seem like that that intensity is not there and that's that's one of the signs that there's a problem going on i have found also for my recovery that good and bad are words that are not as helpful so yeah. and all Back and any white. of those always and nevers forevers like any of those mm -hmm. you know uh, one extreme or the other but you know good or bad it's like you know like yeah, they usually and bad. everybody has to start mm -hmm. somewhere like and i think it's like you mentioned sexual reintegration with a couple like it's awkward you know i'm like uh, it's not going to be like oh you know fantastic it's going to be a little awkward and it's okay but that's yeah. real connection yeah it's, it's about so. learning that it's not a rom-com either like you're the sheets you know there's you know the sheets are going to get you're going to get wrapped up again like you're going to roll over on a dog you're going to things are going to leg cramps and it's not going to be this romantic thing where doves fly off the wind i mean it's just there's not romantic music and the sunlight streaming and it's really funny. Like it, it goes from the pendulum swings from one end to the other very often. And we've got to find that happy middle ground. And that's and great. just being okay with like, yeah. it's about connecting. So, okay. Yes. Next question. I think my 21 year old son may have a problem with online porn. Mm -hmm. His father, my husband is an essay. Um, although 
porn is not part of his profile, what should I do to help my son? Porn addiction 101 starts yeah. again, I think March 3rd, but don't hold me to that with dates. I, but we've got so many groups starting again. So on the seeking integrity, like he's of age. So a 21 year old, that would be a really good, there's a ton of resources. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but but you're saying, I think my son. So I don't know if you've had the conversation. Um, yeah, I think about contacting so. a CSAT and having him assess to see if he actually is a sex addict is a great place to start. Um, I think that if his father is in recovery, that would also be a great place for him to um, someone to talk to. Well, he says, my husband is an SA, but doesn't say an SA in recovery. So not a hundred percent sure. Yeah. So, and whether or not porn is part of his profile, I mean, you know, doesn't, sex addiction yeah. doesn't show up for everybody the same way. Um, and sex addiction people, isn't about sex. Porn isn't about yeah. sex. You know, drinking sex isn't about, gosh, that alcohol tastes so great. It's right. like, I'm using it to I escape and numb out. Yeah. So to help your son, it's about resources. It's about having these conversations like, Hey son, you know, um, you're doing a lot of this and you know, what's happening and what's going on just, and, and not being accusatory and not shaming him, but having these conversations, like, you know, I noticed you used to love to play soccer and go out with your friends. And now I'm noticing you've given that up. And, you know, your girlfriend is, you know, you're fighting with your girlfriend a lot because you're always online and what's happening and how can I support you? Um, but I, you know, that's kind of how it starts. It's all about the communication and being supportive and not shaming through that. Um, if his father is in recovery, I hope he is, um, you know, having him have these conversations, take him to a meeting, going to a meeting with dad, sure, whatever it takes. Um, but yeah, that would be great. Um, this is not uncommon. I actually treat teens. So this starts very young and it escalates very quickly. So I would say a lot of young adults have problems with pornography. You know, we hand it to them when they're young, unfortunately. So it's conversations. Well, and they, and the kids learn from other kids. I mean, it's like they, of course. they get it from other kids. So, yeah. okay. Okay. Next question. Is conflict avoidance between spouse and my family mother enmeshment? My spouse complains that I never support her in front of my parents who are orthodox and expect traditional rule, roles, um, male, female roles. I feel it is not necessary to change them now, especially when they do not live with us and visit once a year for short periods. Okay. So I'm assuming Orthodox Jews. Um, so I'm Jewish, not Orthodox, but I'm Jewish. So, um, okay. Conflict avoidance between spouse and my family, mother, enmeshment. Um, not necessarily, um, but if your spouse is complaining that you don't support her in front of your parents, for whatever reason, that sounds like something to talk about. Um, it's not about changing your parents, but it's about talking to your spouse and having a plan before you go visit them or before they visit you. It's about having boundaries when they come visit you, like the short periods. What is a short period? Is it a week? Is your short period the same as your wife's short period? Is, you know, are they overstepping boundaries that your wife has established in her home because it is her house and you're they're the guests and you know even if listen this is your home and they are the guests and is that how you're running the household then they you know there needs to be some respect there does your wife agree with the traditional male female roles she may not. Um, it, not that's yeah. what I'm reading in this it's like the parents expect it so things get put into right, those traditional it. roles and and I think it's very fair for you to say this parents we love thing. you we love your visit but we live our life and That's you get it. to yeah. yeah and I I'm not Jewish so I understand cultural Either things but Jewish at some point you're, you're married to your spouse and like right. you're married 52 weeks out of the year so if parents are visiting one week they're guests in your home and I think you know just say I want you to know, like, you know, I, I want you to value my 
prospective spouse, you know, I value her greatly. And I, you know, I do not want, you know, anything of like, oh, you should be cooking or you should be cleaning or whatever. Like, no, yeah. but like we want you to visit, come visit, visit the kids, whatever. But, you know, like, and it does take you stepping into that space. Conflict avoidance is well, not necessarily a measurement, but sure isn't supportive of your spouse yeah, who's no. there 52 weeks yeah. a year. Yeah, I would, I mean, I, I think that the, the mesh, it's not a meshment necessarily, but if you are not able to support your spouse in, you know, that, that is, it seems like it's a problem. It seems like it's affecting your relationship and it seems like those effects ripple out and are residual the rest of the year for you. And if your spouse is dreading your parents, maybe they don't need to stay in your home. Maybe they yeah. should stay in yeah. a hotel. Yes. There are other ways to kind of solve this. And, and mm -hmm. that might be a better way. Or you go visit them by yeah, yourself. Maybe you, you visit know? them yeah. by yourself. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of ways to solve this. But um, if they're expecting traditional male, female roles, and that's not how your wife um, lives her life, that's not going to be okay. And you shouldn't try to force her into that. That seems very unfair for even for one week a year. Yeah. I don't think that, that would, I, that wouldn't fly very well with me. Either. I wouldn't like no. that much, but. Okay. Next question. Can you give a timeline of how recovery from sex addiction should be? Oh. It, that so depends. What does it look like? <laughs> Being abstinent is one thing. Yes. And that is where it starts. What should happen before another thing can happen? We definitely can't work on our marriage until the foundation is made. I agree. I know disclosure should come later, not early on. Yes, 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 yes. So, okay. A yeah. timeline. So basically I, the word should to me, like it's different for every it's, single yes. person. It's different for every single yeah. couple because everybody is different, but if we're just doing very, you know, umbrella kind of terms, the first thing we do is, you know, the addict has to get into recovery, not just sober, not just checking boxes. Yes, I'm seeing my therapist. Yes, I'm going to meetings, but recovery, meaning I'm starting to actually change my behavior. And if they're married or in a, in a committed relationship, the um, partner also has to start seeing those changes of behavior and taking care of themselves as well and starting to heal from their wounds and their um, betrayal. And, you know, being abstinent is kind of like, that's really 101. I mean, that's like kind of the basics. Yeah, that's um, like not drinking if you're an alcoholic. Great, yeah, I'm not like, drinking, but that's like, that doesn't mean I've changed anything yeah, that's else. that's not... So, yes. yeah. so what should happen before another thing could happen? I mean, recovery is a big part of this and recovery is different for everybody, but it's really about changing the behavior around, you know, it's about the middle circle behaviors. If you're familiar with our three circle plans that we all use, but um, yeah, you definitely, we do not recommend couples therapy until after disclosure, usually, unless it's kind of sporadic and it's really about kind of basic communication. But when it comes to sexual betrayal and betrayal trauma, we can't really heal a relationship until the truth has been established. And that happens with full therapeutic disclosure, which can only happen with people who are trained to do that. So that happens later and that can only happen when somebody has recovery and there is a significant change in behavior. Um, I am very empathetic to spouses. I do a lot of disclosures and I'm very empathetic to spouses because as spouses, we do want full disclosure and we want it quickly because we're in pain and we want the truth. And how do we know? What I tell spouses is this, we can do it right away. We can do it right now, but it will not be the whole truth. It will not be complete. He will probably still be lying to use heteronormative terms. And that is not what you deserve. You deserve the entire truth completely. And you deserve it only one time. So I would rather take longer and make sure that he is in really good recovery, meaning he understands what it really means, like what he really did, not just that he saw prostitutes or that he cheated on you or that he was watching porn, but how that impacted you, what that meant, how he destroyed lives 
how that affected everybody, including you and his job and the people he works with and, 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 and him and yeah. him, of course. Yeah. And at a level that is so much deeper than just the surface, which is what you would get if you do it quickly. And usually when I have these conversations with spouses coming from a place of empathy and understanding, usually most of, most of spouses understand that, but it, it is very hard to wait for. And I understand why we want it quickly. Of course I do. Um, it is not a free pass. They do not get a free pass. It is, you know, they are working. So that's kind of the timeline, but we really have to have really good recovery um, before we do a full disclosure. Otherwise, it's not going to be what you deserve. And so um, that's a basic. And then we can do after that, then we can do couples and we start repairing the relationship and we do all kinds of wonderful things with that, including we can do sexual reintegration therapy and all kinds of fun things. So, yeah. So, but to answer um, the question a little bit more, so the timeline, and these are really general, but mm -hmm. things speed up if you get a solid foundation of recovery, like we were talking about, you know, guys that come to treatment, they have a plan, they, you know, they can move forward more quickly. But I often say, if you're doing, if you're spending as much energy on your recovery as you did on your acting out, you'll be great. But that means probably seeing a CSAT therapist for individual and group every week, going to multiple groups, you know, the drop-in groups on uh, sexandrelationshiphealing.com, being on this, great. 12-step groups, having a sponsor. Like if you're really doing the work, you know, you will get there faster. When I hear, and I do, you know, oh, he's seeing a therapist every week or two. You're seeing a therapist for 50 minutes for something that is years probably decades old issues and how in one 50 minute session, even with the best, the most amazing therapists helping, are you supposed to, you're probably talking about what happened this week. Well, what happened this week? And you're never getting to that underlying issue. So, so really dedicating like, okay, I'm committing to changing and I'm willing to do the work. You can do well. That said, partners, timeline is behind because the addicts known all along that they're lying they, they've known partners get hit by the truck you know like oh you know discovery you know uh, so so their timeline for some for a higher level of healing like you can be stabilized you can you know and and uh you can have support but like to finally kind of go okay you know and be able to um to really start seeing that trust can be rebuilt is typically 12 to 24 months behind the addict. And I hate to say that, but I also don't want to sugarcoat it that like, oh, if, you know, if he just does this and we do disclosure and then we're going to be fine and we're going to be, no, this is a journey. Addiction, you know, is a forever journey. I am an addict always. I never use recovered. I'm never going to be beyond this. I will always be active in my recovery, I hope, because I don't want to be active in my addiction. And, you know, my husband does not worry about me, you know, I mean, because I do what I need to do on a daily basis to take care of my recovery. So, so all of those parameters to give you really no timeline, I'm sorry, <laughs> but, but there, you know, but there is it's an individual journey too. I mean, really, you get out of it, what you put into it. Yeah. So if he and really, really does that in the beginning and early recovery, it's like, three meetings a week minimum like and then minimum yeah. twice a week yeah and you know but it's not every other week it that's not like that's kind of barely it's yeah it should be very intense in the beginning and and I think that um and I think you know going to treatment is a really like a huge that, I mean, that's a huge jump. It's off. a huge jump starter. Yeah. Last, so, yeah. Huge so, jump so I'm going to jump to the last question only because we're talking about what recovery is like. How can you tell if they're truly in good recovery? First of all, your gut knows it. I talk to partners all the time and their gut, like he's again, he's saying he's in recovery, but their gut is churning. Guess what? Believe your gut. If you start seeing it's his actions, it's, it's an addict's actions. It's 
our lips will move and we'll be lying to ourselves and everyone else. But if you see, it's like we were talking about at the beginning of the, of the webinar, the um, out of the doghouse work group, that's about how do you rebuild trust? If you say you're going to take out the trash, you take out the trash. If you're, I mean, if you're going to go to the store and get a gallon of milk, you're going to go to the store and get a gallon of milk. You're going to do your actions are going to be going to be congruent with your words. That's how you really tell. And, and trust me, people, people can see when I hear a partner say, I think he's in like, I'm going like, it's not enough safety yet that you are trusting that. When I hear a partner say he's in good recovery and I really can see him, he's showing up differently. That's, that's how you can, you can tell. So, and I don't mean to also, skip if, questions, but. If them, you know, it's the partner saying, you know, he, he just seems really different. He's empathetic. He's present. He's not on his phone all the time. Like he's actually he's not defensive. He's not, not defensive. Yeah, yeah. He's listening. He's asking me about myself and he's, you know, really present, but it's not stuff like, well, now he goes to the store. Okay, great. Well, now he takes, you know, now he helps with the kids. Yeah, well, good. That's called being a and father. I was going to say they're yeah. his kids too. So yeah, so that's yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, but it but it's just sure being congruent fine. with your actions, you know, mm -hmm. and because it it, it 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 it's work, and so I, you know, I often say, you know, absent is just not doing. Sober is like, okay, I'm starting to put the pieces together. You know, I'm, I'm starting to, you know, get this a little bit recovery is I live my life differently. You see it in all aspects. You know, I love that our program is called seeking integrity. That's integrity across, you know, I mean, there's no compartmentalized. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I've got integrity around work, you know, but I'm, you know, cheating well, on my taxes you, or whatever else, you know, it's everything. It's not, I'm going to meetings, I'm seeing my therapist, I'm going to group. That's not recovery. That's, that's sober. That's sober. <laughs> like, that's great. Good for you. Mm -hmm. Now change all your behaviors around mm -hmm. that. Are you mm -hmm. still fantasizing? Are you telling the truth? Are you communicating? Are you talking about your feelings? Are you doing the work? I mean, are you working all your steps? Are you calling your sponsors? Are, I mean, what does this look like? Are you doing something every day to make sure you're showing up for your spouse in a different way in your family and your children and your I mean it's it's changing who you are fundamentally to be in recovery it's a lot of work and it takes time but it's worth it so it's so really yes it's it. a lot of work but like I wouldn't trade one minute yeah. of my yeah. recovery you know for for going back to I, I, I want so we've got a lot of enmeshment okay. questions Go so okay yeah. and I put in the chat um so on in the rooms there was a super Saturday recovery summit and there was actually one Dr. Ken Adams did about um other enmeshment and it might be useful because we're getting some enmeshment so so he did the podcast with Dr. Rob on sex love and addiction um, podcast series, but he also did a, a webinar um, on in the room. So I put both of those links in the chat, but this person says, could you recommend any take-home assessment for a mother enmeshment? Um, how do you know if it is actually mother enmeshment or your partner is just not understanding or is gaslighting? Mm -hmm. There's actually online on Dr. Adams' website. I will put that is, in. Yeah, there is an online assessment. Uh, well, a little like uh, online kind of, you know, a little assessment, a little quiz you can take. Um, it's overcoming enmeshment. Overcoming for those enmeshment. of that, yeah. And I'm putting that in the website. chat. Um, yeah. But overcomingenmeshment.com is the mm -hmm. website. So. Yeah, so there's something online and you can go on there and see if you qualify. Mm -hmm. And the books, I mean, you know, Silently Seduced, When He's Married to Mom, it'll be pretty like, oh, oh, you know, or, or it yeah. doesn't resonate at all. So yeah, and mother enmeshment is, by the way, there's also father enmeshment. It's not just mother enmeshment, like women right. can be enmeshed with their parents as well. So, but, the, but, I, but unfortunately daughters are often seen as, oh, you're a good daughter. And that there's that good and bad. You're a good daughter. Cause you're you, so, so, um, women are struggle more to get help with it. And I think part of it is that partners, you know, so female partners of male, um, males who are enmeshed with mother, you know, are more likely to help them find a, a path I mean they're so so often that you know it's it, it, it's come to 
a point where something needs to be done. So, yep, that happens. Okay. So, the next question I need to talk to my essay husband about the depth of pain he has caused. What is your recommended format to do this? I have written an impact statement, but we have not been able to discuss it because other things are going on. I suspect shame and defensiveness will not allow him to hear what I need to share. And it is important for him to hear it. Not so he can feel like a bad person, but in order for me to know he has heard that this has been done and what I need to work through. Now, this feels like I'm a do it yourself for this to, yeah, I don't hear a, a, a qualified idea. professional. So yeah, yeah. this is what you need to talk to your husband about the depth of pain he has caused is you need to get a CSAT and you guys need to seek professional help. This is not something we do. You do not attempt to, I mean, it's really a bad idea to attempt to write an impact letter even without professional guidance because even an impact letter is a very specialized way of doing this. Um, and we can provide that guidance just because there is an actual way to do this where how you do it is also what makes him hear it a little better. It really helps him hear it in, in it's worded so it doesn't shame him. Um, that you haven't been able to discuss it because of other things going on tells me that this is not a priority for him or you. So, I mean, maybe it, it maybe is. Maybe you, him, but yeah. But, but not for him, right? Yeah. But, you know, this is where we don't do, we don't do this on our own. This and I say this really often too. So Dr. Yeah. Rob does once a week, a peer group for professionals. Mm -hmm. it, you, the number one topic at the group disclosure. on a weekly basis is disclosure, formal sure. therapeutic disclosure and yeah. supporting the betrayed partner. This yeah. is a process that even the professionals are seeking guidance from other professionals about. So a DIY project, you know, I watch like the home TV things and it's, you know, some of the ones that were, you know, the, but like we tried to fix our house ourselves and they're in a hot mess and they have to call in the professionals. Don't do that. Don't do I it. Really, you know, I really do appreciate though her, um, that she, I really appreciate though, that you really are concentrating on understanding he's not a bad person and that you are trying to love him through this. And that, but that you are even struggling with, you know, making sure he has heard this and you don't want to shame him. That is amazing and that you have this right idea. It shows that you've done some research and that you're understanding that, you know, his shame is not going to allow him. And that's because he hasn't done the work to be in a place where he can hear an impact letter. That's why we do therapeutic disclosure after a period of recovery and working with CSATs. We don't do it like, okay, now we're gonna set aside some time. This is a really, it's a process. This is kind of a whole choreographed thing that CSATs do. We don't just and decide I, how we're gonna I, do this. Yeah. I, and yeah. I hope we're running out of time. So I, I hope he's in the attachment wounds work group uh, mm -hmm. that it started tonight on the seeking integrity because that's they talk about shame, reducing shame, having the resiliency, you know, to move forward, understanding that oh, that's you know that's my judge that's telling me I'm not I'm whatever. So that work group is specifically how you can he could learn to do things differently and be able to go oh yeah that's yeah. identify that attachment wound so please, hopefully please, he joined that yeah please reach out and you know get some you can go on itap.com you can reach out to tammy but please he got some referrals for csats on that that could be very yeah very and some helpful. of them are very good um some of them are good so uh, okay how is mother enmeshment different in men versus women well, um, women, so do women enmesh with their mothers? They do. Um, it is, it shows up differently. For men, it's very much, it's all attachment. So this is about unhealthy attachment. It's an attachment disorder. So how men show up, this is very complicated because it can show up so many different ways. Um, I mean, I don't even have time to go into how this shows up so differently. But so maybe it, you come back another time yeah, and, or we do a special webinar on you know, some of those. So 
Yeah, that's um, a long but answer. I still think, because, and I asked Dr. Adams, I, he's a friend of mine, when he did yeah. Silently Seduced, and in the back of the book, it talks about women, mm -hmm. but I was like, you need a whole book on that. So yeah. I, I would mm -hmm. encourage you, Better. and I put the uh, link in the chat, the Overcoming Enmeshment, check it out. But that might be something to reach out to Dr. Adams directly about, you know, as well. But in Silently Seduced, you know, there are some correlations as well. But, you know, if there's an unhealthy um, if, if the mother is, is, um, boundaryless, you know, and impeding your relationship, your ability to connect with other people, that's a problem. That's, so yeah, that's a problem. Okay. All right. So as a porn addict, how do I build, uh, oh, how do I build a good sense of communication? I am in recovery and even a simple touch my addict sees as an invitation for sex. That, this is a great question about how do you have healthy boundaries about touching? Right. So um, you are in recovery evil. Simple touch. My addict sees as an invitation for sex. So, oh, if your partner gives you even a simple touch. So um, this is about you guys learning what is healthy touch and what is not healthy touch. And the thing I'm also seeing is like, that you are still in a place where you think all touch is an invitation for sex. And you're saying, well, my addict sees that. That's a little bit of denial. Um, and that is showing that there's some more work to be done, which is the good news. It means that you can do more work. Um, this is not just about communication. This is about your work. Not every touch is an invitation. And what is the work that you need to do to start to understand that? What are the boundaries? Handholding is not sex, right? Yeah, sensate focus touch. You can work on that with a CSAT who's qualified and done that training. Um, building a sense of communication um, is about talking. It's about saying, is it okay if I hold your hand? Is it okay if I sit closer to you? May I put my arm around you? But just because you're allowed to do that doesn't mean that's an invitation for anything more. And that shows that maybe you're not ready for that work. Maybe there's more work you have to do in recovery before you can move on to that. And that's okay. Um, but it's, it, this is also, you know, maybe how else am I acting out? Like maybe am I still fantasizing? Is there some objectification going on? Um, am I really addressing everything that I need to address? Um, because, you know, you're calling it my addict. It's interesting because this is one way we stay in denial sometimes, right? We kind of say, well, it's me, here's good me and here's bad me. And we call the bad me, which is the shame, my addict. And then we call the good me, the real me. But what we have to understand is it's all me. We're all the same person. We're all one person. And there's no good you or bad you. You're a good person, right? You wouldn't be listening to this stuff. You have morals and values. Obviously, you're a good person if you're concerned about this. You don't want to touch someone in a bad way. So doing that work and understanding that um, I'm trying to do things better and differently. How are some more ways I can do that is really going to be important. And that's just doing recovery in a different way. So if you're not seeing a therapist, find one, do the deeper work that can really help you. Yeah. So that's okay. what I can We've got say. two more questions. We're going to see okay. if we can get through these. Uh, we're almost out of time. Is okay. mother enmeshment more common in Eastern culture than in West mm -hmm. and how um, culture variables affect enmeshment? And and I think oh, that there are some cultural things, absolutely. but it still is boundary. So yeah, so thoughts? I'm multiculturally trained. I know exactly what you're asking. And I do think there are cultural culture variables that can affect a measurement, but I think it's a worldwide thing. I don't think it's, you know, more, it can be more common in certain cultures, but it's not only found in certain cultures. Um, you know, there are certain stereotypes and tropes that we think of as like the overbearing mother, but it shows up everywhere. And that's again, a whole other book Ken Adams could probably write. Um, so that would be add that onto the list of our other, our next group, Tammy, that'd be good. And, but and, yeah, and at the end of the day, if it's problematic, so just because it's accepted, you know, I mean, 
there are certain things that, for example, a stereotype is a Latin culture that these things are accepted. It doesn't mean that within your relationship, it's okay. You know, so, right. so it really is, how do you, you know, how do you want to move forward? And just because something happens all the time, you know, it, with other people doesn't, doesn't right. just make because, it necessarily right for you. So. Yeah. Just because in certain cultures, you're supposed to do something and this is the way your family's always been maybe that's not working anymore for your family and you're allowed yeah. to make changes and what's healthy and right for you. And yes. maybe your partner. and have discussions within like Absolutely. what, you know, what do you want for your relationship? Going back to that, Dr. Stan Patkin um, podcast, we do, what does our healthy relationship look like? What do we want to, you know, what do we want? Doesn't everybody want to have a great relationship? We should all be striving for that, not accepting you know, accepting less. So, okay. Last question. How do I convince my spouse to visit a CSAT to help him understand that he is mother enmeshed? Okay. Again, you can't convince somebody to do anything, but plant the little seed like, Hey, I was listening to this podcast and isn't this interesting. And I heard there's this thing called a CSAT. Um, maybe we should make an appointment together and just go and talk about some things or, Oh, I heard about this website or it's kind of coming from curiosity. It's kind of making a suggestion, seeing if there's an interest or just, you know, I read this article. What do you think about this? Um, do you, does any of this resonate with you? I was thinking about this and this kind of felt, something came up for me when I was reading this. This reminded me of something that I felt. What do you think? So it's kind of about doing it in a really kind, kind of around the way, um, around the way way. But it's also, um, you know, if we ever try to convince somebody to do something, they're probably not ready and they, they're probably going to get defensive. Um, helping somebody to understand something is probably not going to go well. It, it invites them to be defensive. Coming from empathy and kindness and helping them from a place of support and, you know, this is something that I'm worried about and I love you and I care about you is a much better way to kind of open that door and it's little baby steps. Um, and when in doubt, always lean on the professionals, have somebody, you start seeing a CSAT, have your person come in as their guest, as your guest. That's the best way. I get tons of people, well, bring your wife in as a guest because she's not seeing a CSAT and the addict is, I'm like, oh, bring her in. Well, she doesn't want to see anyone. That's Okay. Maybe she's scared of therapists. Maybe she had a terrible experience. You know, it's all about- Or she's who, going to be afraid that something's wrong with I'm her. Going to tell when her it's, yeah, yeah, I mean, because that's the codependent language. Yeah. You're terrible yeah. For, whatever it is, like there's a way to do it where we can be empathetic and kind and um, leaning on professionals is a great way to start to help your partner. And, and we have little tricks and we know not, they're not tricks, it's not manipulation, but it's ways to help everybody kind of help other people they care about too. We've been, we, you can trust us to do this. Um, and we kind of know complex this work. Things. Yeah. It yeah. Well, and, but, and I really do think, I, I think if it comes, you know, even people that are trying to get their partner to go, I, I need you to go to treatment you know it's like I really care about you I want the best for you I want yeah. us to have a future yes. and we don't right now Dr. Rob does a lot of expert consultations because you know people are struggling and it's like this is not working and we want to get expert help so that right. we can have a path forward so there is Come help yeah yeah That's there is help there is for. hope so Okay. We have, we're late. So um, we're, we're going to have healthy boundaries. We're going to stop. And so okay. thank you, my colleague, Michelle, thank, thank you, you all for joining. And um, the recording will be put on the uh, sex and relationship healing.com uh, website. Michelle will be back another time. So thanks everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. Everybody. Bye.